Here, we look at criteria for a potentially viable commercial utility scale offshore wind farm by way of lots of examples. These come up as Ken, with an oil and gas background, dashes around the globe looking for ideal spots for a wind farm. His passion is dimmed, slightly, only by his complete ignorance of the topic. But this works for us, because he asks lots of good questions. For example, after investigating Iceland as a new Kuwait of offshore wind, he heads over to the California coast, where the red on this map shows there is indeed plenty of wind. But is that all you need? You also need to think about things like how far the site is from shore. Too close, and local stakeholders might well object, as they do in our Unit 5 case study, by the way, to spoiled views and their economic impacts on tourism, for example. Too far, and well, it's not just a matter of spooling out more cable to shore, you have to add additional kit, needed to reduce what are known as transmission losses, effectively electricity leakage on the journey to shore over certain distances. Which leads to potential trade-offs to consider. Gavin's asides and drill downs on the techno-economic side of offshore wind, by which I mean what you need and what it might cost, are very newbie-friendly, I can attest. He points you to places where the tech makes commercial sense and where it's highly unlikely to. You'll also see how distance from shore affects maintenance strategies, such as whether to use small vessels to make daily trips from shore, or larger ones which house the crew and roam the farm. In addition to distance, another major criteria to consider is coastal water depth. Some places are plenty windy, but in waters too deep for the existing early 2020s mainstream offshore technology, which has proven itself at the commercial utility scale, and which we'll model in our case study. This technology uses turbines, which are fixed by towers and foundations to the seabed, which you can't do when the water gets too deep. For this reason, we commissioned for this course a custom offshore global wind atlas, which will show you at a glance both where the wind speeds are interesting enough and the water depths are currently feasible at scale. This map is free to download for all enrolled students. This is actually something Gavin has wanted to do since adolescence. Pretty well played, actually. The new lens it gives really makes a difference. For example, in the Polish Baltic Sea, windy areas are colored. And if there are no diagonal crosshatch lines, it means the area is shallow enough for fixed bottom wind farms. Now, what's really interesting is how well the criteria Gavin set for the map design explains for the most part where the industry and governments are actually studying or planning offshore wind farms for example, these colored areas in the bottom map, and also where these are under construction or even up and running. You'll be able to see this in loads of other places too. For example, Southern Australia, Northern Brazil, the U.S. Mid-Atlantic, the south coast of China. The list goes on. You might actually find it revealing to spend a bit of time zooming in yourself on the world's coasts. Overall, the map does a pretty impressive job explaining what kind of planned or existing developments are going where as well as why some areas are avoided. There are, of course, some wrinkles. These planned developments are all in water, which is too deep for today's mainstream, fixed-bottom offshore wind technology, which is what we use in our rigorously costed case study model in Unit 5. However, we do spend some time on plans for a second emerging technology. 
floating wind, which can go into deep water and therefore cross-hatched areas like you see here. It's still early days for commercial floating wind at utility scale, but as you'll see in detail, it is an area seeing a surge of industry interest and ambition. The technology is evolving fast too. If it bears fruit as hoped and planned, it could be a total game changer. You don't need to spend much time at all with our map to see how much of the world's windy coastal areas, which economic floating wind, could liberate for utility-scale generation. And there are other aspects to consider too. An offshore wind site is kit-intensive. That kit has to come from somewhere, leading to the question of sufficiency of local supply chains and supporting infrastructure, like specialised ports. Otherwise, it has to be imported. You'll also get a beginner's grounding in the challenges of integrating intermittent renewables like offshore wind into the grid, which needs to stay very finely balanced between supply and demand pretty unforgivingly. Because when the grid wobbles just a bit more than a hair out of balance, it can fail. Not a good thing when we all expect electricity to be available all the time. This segues into the role of utility-scale energy storage. Like floating wind, this is another technology which, if it gets cheap enough, could rewrite the rule book for offshore wind and other renewable energy sources. You'll get a look at the idea behind technology cost forecasting frameworks like these, called experience curves. These can be quite useful, as long as you keep their limitations in mind. So, from Unit 1, you'll get a lot of useful high-level framing of issues which impact offshore wind. It's a unit you can pretty much lean back and watch. That will change as the course progresses, and we switch to more of a micro-project lens and get hands-on with the exercises. For example, in Unit 2.